welcome once again to The Simple Truth. It is a pleasure to come to you through these airways and, and teach the Word of God. I want you to, uh, I pray that you've been getting wisdom from God's Word, uh, that you're understanding what's being said and that you, you're applying it to yourself. And maybe even if you have the opportunity to even teach it to others uh, as it's been presented uh, in truth. Know what you're talking about before you, you say it. Uh, that's what needs to be. <clears throat> and then have the boldness to, to speak the truth. But today we're in chapter 6 again. Um, we're going to start with verse 11 uh, in a study of Hebrew. Uh, hope you got your pen and paper out and you got your Bible out and we're, we're going through it together. Um, this is a time of, of, of refreshing encouragement. Um, also giving us warnings because that's the way God does it. He didn't, when He paints a picture, He paints the warts and all. Uh, he not only shows the good side, but He also shows you know, the, the places we need to work with. Uh, and that's for all of us. So verse 11, we'll get started today. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Now, what he's talking about here is, is, is what we ended up with, with last week is, is that we continue to minister, that we consider ministering the love of God, um, that, that we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in the things that we need to do and, and understand. And, and then uh, the writer says, we as, as the corporate Church uh, desires that each one of you show the same diligence. In other words, be steadfast in it. Don't give up. Don't slow down. Uh, I, I know that when I first got saved and was in the church that uh, I was a ball of fire. I wanted to just keep going and I wanted everybody to know about it and, and I wanted them to have the same experience as I was. And, and then you you got those older saints in the church that'll tell you, well, he'll calm down. It may be a little time, but he'll calm down. Don't let the fire go out. Continue to be diligent in the knowing of God, being a seeker of God. That's one thing that God has taught me. Always be a seeker of him. There is never going to be a time on this earth when me or you are going to know everything about the Word of God or everything about God Himself. We're going to keep learning, we're going to keep experiencing, and we're going to keep, don't stop. You see, that diligence, that steadfastness, that seeking will take us to the place where we are fully assured of hope until the end. In other words, that hope that we have is that when Jesus was raised from the grid, that that was going to happen to us too. That this old body, when it quits, is going to be resurrected and reunited with my spirit again when Jesus comes at the rapture in the air. He won't touch earth then. Second coming, he touches the earth. But then, but we have that hope now. To the end, but we have to be diligent. We have to be seekers. We have to be steadfast in it. We have to keep going. Don't let that that what we call the fire of God, the love of God, ever burn out in you. Don't let it kindle down to no flame at all. Stir it up. Uh, and then he says, "Do not be sluggish." In other words, don't let your fire for God, your love for God, slow down to where it's just a burning coal. No flame, just glow. And it, to, but, but that's what we're not supposed to do. But we're supposed to be imitating those of faith that, that is before us. Um, if you've got a great pastor that, that, that is truly showing in his life Christ to you and preaching the word to you, you can imitate them. There's people that, that are not considered to be ministers, although they are, 
because they're ministering to you and I in different ways. They may not be in the pulpit. They may not be preaching, but they're preaching. And that is by the life that they're living, by the love they're showing, by the grace that's coming, and the, and the mercy that they show. Now, sometimes that on the good side, and sometimes it's, it's on the side of patience. Patiently waiting to inherit the promise of eternal life that God has for you and I. We have to be patient. And yet, still continue to have that joy that God has given us because of the hope of the resurrection, because of what Christ has done. Our hope is in Him and that it will happen to us because of what Christ did and that we are obedient and we're steadfast and the joy of the Lord pours out of us and that's at His love. Now verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessings I will bless you, and multiply, multiply I will multiply you. And so after he had uh, patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now take a look at these. God made a promise, and he didn't make, and, and really what he's saying is God made an oath to Abraham, the promise of a son through Sarah. And because there was no one greater than God himself, he swore or made an oath by himself. Now, having said that, here is the oath. Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiply I will multiply you. What God was saying to him was, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, because of faithfulness. Because you believe what I said, and you considered it to be righteousness. It was accounted to you as righteousness. And not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to multiply that blessing and I'm going to multiply you. Now, now here, the blessing was, was the promised son through Sarah. But here he's saying, don't cut this blessing short. This blessing is for many. I'm not going to add one, I'm going to multiply. We need to understand that in God's system, blessings are to be multiplied. Not just singular or just add to, but multiplied. So that we reach out to all other people around us and we become children of Abraham in a sense, seed of Abraham. Because, not because of the natural method through, through, our, you know, through our ancestry, but through faith. Now, let's go on. And so, after he had uh, patiently endured, he obtained the promise. In other words, it didn't come right away. We live in this society today that we think everything ought to be now. Everything has to be right now. We can't wait on it. It's got to be now. And God says that Abraham patiently waited for his blessing. I want you to understand, sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it does happen rather quickly. But sometimes it takes years. And I know of cases where people have prayed for a loved one for years and years and years, and they died, and then that loved one finally got saved. So understand, we need to be patient, always believing, never doubting that God will perform His Word. Uh, so verse 16, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for uh, confirmation is for them an end of all disputes. In other words, we are 
when we make an oath, we, we have to fulfill it. Um, if, if you have said you are going to donate certain things or, or a certain amount to something, do it. You made an oath to do that. You have agreed to do that by your word. Verse 17, thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutable of his counsel, confirming it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have uh, fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, Talk about this a little bit. God is determined to show it more abundantly. Uh, you know, we talk about giving at times, and how Jesus said, you know, He will, what we give, He will give, uh, pressed down, shaken together, and roll, overflowing. Well, that's the idea here. Uh, not only am I, I'm not going to just bless you enough. I'm going to overly bless you. I'm going to continue. But it takes our obedience and our faith to bring those things about. So we do those things. And, and it's an oath that we, we make that I'm going to trust him forever. Uh, and then he says, when God made his oath, it was two immutable things. In other words, two guarantees, two things that cannot be changed. One is his word can never be changed. And the other is his faith. Oh, God has faith. Yes. He knows that when he speaks, it will not come back to him void. It will accomplish what he set out for it to do. And that's why we know that God cannot lie. We know that his word is true. We know that his word changes lives. And he changes you and I. And we have this, this great hope that we can hold on to set before us. Because of God's promises, because of his blessings, because of his faithfulness, because of what Christ has done, there's where our hope lies. In that, you know, uh, we have not seen it yet, but we know it's there. It, it's already been guaranteed by God's word. Uh, it goes on and he talks about in verse 19. This hope we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, uh, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Notice that he's talking about this great hope that we have in Christ. The, the things that cannot be changed but are always steadfast, are always true, will not be changed. We have this hope, and it anchors our faith both to assure and the steadfast to which the presence of God, the presence we're talking about is God that we enter behind the veil. We believe that when Jesus died on the cross that the veil ripped from top to bottom of the Holy of Holies so that we now have entrance into that Holy of Holy places, into the throne room of God with our prayers. And one day, if we stay steadfast to Him, we will stand in the presence of God. Right now, we can feel His presence. Uh, we know that the Scripture tells us that we, God inhabits the praise of his people. If you and I would praise him, his presence will come. It will, it will show up in the sense of, of knowing that we know that he's there. Knowing that he is with us. Knowing that he's, he is in praise with us. Uh, Oh, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that when we praise, 
Jesus is, we sing our, our prayers, our praise and, and, and things like that. Jesus is singing with us to the Father. I think that's, that's amazing that, that He's a part of the praise. He is the presence. He is there. He is in the midst of us. That we can enter into that veil uh, because He opened it up the way. Uh, verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So he's talking about Jesus is now the high priest. He's the one that enters in the Holy of Holies, not the one here on earth, but the one in heaven. So he is the high priest of the original Holy of Holies, the presence of God. Now chapter 7 brings us in Melchizedek. Now listen to these things. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of the days nor ending of the days, but made like the Son of God, remaining a priest forever. Let's try to open this up to you. Melchizedek, actually his name means uh, peace and righteousness. <clears throat> he was a king of Salem, and, and Salem was a place which we know today as Jerusalem, and that he was a high priest of the, Mohi, of the Most High God. Uh, so he was a high priest. Uh, and he met Abraham returning from the battle that he just won. Uh, and then Abraham gave a tenth part of all. In other words, all the spoils that, that he had gained from the defeat of the enemy, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. We have that tithe wrapped up into that even before the law of Moses was brought into picture. And so that we're still uh, should be given a tenth, a tithe uh, to, to the work of God, to the churches. Uh, but then he goes on and he tells us that when he gave this, he was, he was recognizing Melchizedek as a high priest of God. Now, it does not tell us how he knew that. It does not tell us any of those things. Uh, it's kind of a gray area for us. So, uh, but he recognized him as a high priest. Uh, notice that uh, first translated king of righteousness, that's Melchizedek. Um, and then the king of Salem means king of peace. Uh, it, it comes from the word Salome, which means peace. Uh, and so uh, here we have this man who we do not know when he was born. We have no idea when he was bed. He died. And that is a picture of Christ. He is not only our king, but he is our righteousness, our peace, and he had no beginning because he is eternal. He will never die, so he is eternal that way. So here we have this capsule picture of a person who is a type of Christ. A type that shows us that this priesthood, this high priest, was not of the Levi tribe, where the high priest in, in the Moses law of Moses that God gave to him. All high priests, all priests came out of, Levit, out of the Levites. And here's one that's a high priest, but he's not a Levite. So it's telling us also that Jesus is not going to be a, a, a Levite and that he is not going to be uh, ministering in, in, the, in the Holy of Holies here on earth, but he's a different type of high priest that will be ministering in the true 
holy of holies in heaven. Now, let us continue. <coughs> uh, showing is showing that it is like the Son of God remains a priest continually. There was no, we don't know when he died, so he is continuing. He may still be alive today. We don't know. Um, but now, verse 4. Now, considering how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood, having a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Now, verse 6, But he whose gene genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. So, so here we see, when the law came into to existence here, God used Moses to bring the law. Then it was commanded that the Levite tribe would be the priest. And that they had the right to, to receive tithes from the other tribes. Now, understand, they also have to, to pay tithes. And that is, they paid tithes through Abraham before the law was in existence. Okay? Now, um, verse 7, Now beyond all contradictions, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Notice he's making a point here that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham himself. And through Abraham, tithing to Melchizedek, also the priesthood, the earthly priesthood through the Levi paid tithes. Verse 8, Here mortal men received tithes, but there he received them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of, of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, uh, Levi wasn't even born yet, but because he's an ancestor of Abraham, when Abraham paid tithes, they paid tithes too. And I think that's important for us to know uh, is, is that we pay tithes, a tenth of what we make. Uh, now, I also believe that the church itself ought to pay tithe to some organization that is doing the work of the gospel uh, to whether it is, is a mission field or whether it is, it is a, uh, a group that, that, is, that is working to, to touch people's lives under the concept of Christ. Uh, we as a church ought to be doing that. I, I firmly believe that. And so far, every church I've been a part of uh, that I know of has been doing that. I know the ones I've pastored is definitely doing that. Uh, and so I think it's important that we all should do that. Now, let's, let's go on a little more about this priesthood. Verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levite priesthood, for under it the people received the law, that further need was there any that another... Uh, priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to call, be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Notice what he's saying. Because Melchizedek was not of the law, it came afterwards. The priesthood was in Levi, which, which was a, a son of, of Abraham in 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 ancestry that the tithes was paid. But Melchizedek was not a part of the Levites. So he's saying there's going to, that when Jesus came and died on the cross that he became a high priest not in the order of the law because it's been changed. 
And also, the law itself has been changed. We're no longer under the Mosaic law that, that the Old Testament um, Israel was under. We are under a different commandment. We're under a different priesthood. It is not one that is, that is through uh, a, a natural uh, human, th but from a very spiritual, godly sense that we have a new high priest and that his name is Jesus and that we are to follow him. But also the law itself has been changed. That now we have a spiritual law that we follow. Okay? Let's go on a little farther here. For he of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no man was officiated at the altar. Talking about Christ. Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek that arise another priest, who has come not according to the law of the flesh, fleshly commandments, but according to the power of the endless life. Notice he's talking about that Jesus would not have been a, a priest in the Mosaic law because he, did, he was not part of the tribe of, Israel, of uh, Levi. He, he is of Judah. And yet he is made a high priest by the one of power of endless life. So the priesthood has changed. And now we have a different one. Verse 17, For he testified, For you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, this is a new priesthood. Not one of the Levites, not one of the natural, but of God. This is a spiritual high priest that we know and testify of. It is spiritual laws that we follow and live by now. But some of those laws supersedes some of the, some of the laws in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, but we are to follow the laws of God now. And that Jesus is making very much a point here that Jesus should never have been a high priest according to the Mosaic law. But the priesthood has been changed. And that like Melchizedek, with no beginning, no end, he is our high priest and we follow him. And if the high priest has been changed, the Mosaic law has also been changed. God bless you. We'll catch you up with it next week.